you very, very much. Uh, we have been uh, studying uh, for several months now the importance of the covenant in our study of scriptures in that we cannot understand passages of the Bible in a vacuum. When we talk about studying any verse or chapter or even a book, when we talk about studying in the context, we don't mean just a few verses ahead and a few verses after, or even what is the book, but the context of the entire Bible. We've come to the conclusion this is not a book, this is a library written by several writers and multiple books. There are more books written by varied writers than many of us have in our homes. And in spite of the chronology, in spite of the time span involved in the writing of these books, there is one harmonious subject and that subject is a story of redemption. That story is that God made a perfect world without sin where God lived with his creation. And because of our choices, we made a separation from God. And immediately in Genesis chapter 3, we find God begins a plan of salvation which is not through works, but by grace alone. So when Adam and Eve take the fig leaves and try to cover themselves, that represents their own work in trying to hide their own sin. But God, through his effort, through his work, he slays an animal and gives them the proper cover of skin that covers their sin. So right from there we begin the plan of salvation. And the entire book then explains how the plan of salvation comes to its fruition in the book of Genesis where we have a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. This is where we have the completion of the plan of salvation. In order for that to take place, God, when he tried to restart the world with Noah. Then we know Noah and his family went out. And how many nations were there? You remember? 72. And the Bible tells us there were 72 nations. That includes all the earth. When Moses asked for help, God said to get Others who may prophesy with him. Others that may teach with him, that may preach with him. How many were there that came to the temple to be dedicated? Seventy plus the two that didn't come. There were 72. How many did Jesus send out to prepare the way? There were 72. Two by two. So the plan of salvation continuously shows us that the entire world was represented by the children of Noah, who then continued in sin to the point of Abraham, where there was nobody left. The entire world had now gone the wrong way. And God chose who? Abraham, who was a son of an idol maker, through whom there would come a people that God would save. God made a covenant with him. It's a quick review, as we usually do, to bring us to today's, sub today's subject. And that promise was, through you, all nations will be blessed. How many? All nations. Who was he talking about? All nations that came through Noah, of which Abraham was a part. And he said, you will have children like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And you will have this special place where you can prosper. And through you, through Samuel, chapter 7, 
of 2 Samuel, God said to Samuel what? Through your seed will come the Son of Man, but also the Son of the Most High. And the seed of Jesse, who will be the king and whose kingdom will reign forever. When God gave that promise to Abraham, he made a covenant with him. But in order for the covenant to come true, through Joseph, he made arrangements for the children of Israel to go into Egypt and there spend over 400 years where they may develop into a great nation. And when the time was right, he brought them out of Egypt. He brought them to Sinai, and there we see the next covenant. We didn't cover, we, we have not spent a lot of time in the covenant with uh, Adam or the covenant with Noah. We're focused more on the covenant with Abraham, Moses, David. And what happened there? At Mount Sinai, God made a covenant with Moses for the children of Israel, because now that the numbers were there, he promised like the stars in the sky, the numbers were there, now he was going to give them a kingdom, and in order to prepare them to, for the kingdom, and to make sure that they were able to get there and prosper the way he wanted them to, he gave them another covenant, which was a threefold covenant, which was what? You guys remember now. The commandments, right? And the commandments were moral, civil, and ceremonial. And what did he do? In the center of the population of the Jews, he built a tabernacle, and there in the Holy of Holies, he put the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was what? The Ten Commandments, there were other items we've discussed, we don't have time to go through that now, but the Ten Commandments were there, and Apostle Paul tells us what? The commandments were given to show as a mirror that we would in fact sin. And at the time that he gave the commandments, he also provided the sacrificial system, knowing full that nobody could keep the commandments. Therefore, they were not going to live and get eternal life by the keeping of the commandments, but they were going to understand that they are a sinful people through the commandments. And in finding their sin, they would go through the sacrificial system and gain their salvation. Covering the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments became the problem. Why? Because through it, the Apostle Paul says what? Until the commandment came, I didn't see any sin. When the commandment came, I became guilty. So the commandment becomes a problem, and the solution is what? The throne of God, the mercy seat. So the salvation doesn't come through the keeping of the commandments. It comes through the mercy of God. And that is the entire story of the sanctuary system. In that sanctuary system, we have been studying the feasts. We've gone through the four feasts of the spring. We've gone through the first feast of the fall. And now we have been studying for the last three weeks Yom Kippur, which is the second feast of the fall. The first feast of the fall was the feast of trumpets. And what is the Feast of Trumpets? We learned that in Leviticus 23. The Feast of Trumpets started on the first day of the seventh month for how many days? It says for ten days. For ten days. This was a ten days of confession of sin because this was a time that God was going to be judging the people. But the preparation for the 10 days of confession of sin started 30 days prior, on the first day of the sixth month. And what did that represent? Let me take you to Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. For those of you that don't know, Exodus comes just after Psalms. No? When Moses came down with the commandments, he saw 
that the people there had built a calf and they were worshiping that calf. And keep in mind, Aaron explains to Moses that the calf really didn't represent any pagan gods. It represented the God who brought them out of Egypt. That's an amazing story. They don't admit that it's a pagan god, but they make an idol representing the God that brought them out of Egypt. Now, they're worshiping this calf. Before we get to that particular verse, in chapter 32, I want to take you back to Exodus chapter 20 for a moment. When we look at the Ten Commandments as outlined in chapter 20, this is still the negotiation part of the covenant that God is going to make with Israel. Chapter 20 is not the final, uh, this, is not a, this is not after the Ten Commandments were given. This is when God is just explaining to them commandments. So chapter, uh, chapter 20 Verse 1, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So he identifies himself so we know who the covenant is with. This is the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, number the second one. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven or above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Now, I'm not going to continue reading all of that. But this particular second commandment becomes very important. Very, very, very important for several reasons. One, it is a tangible, uh, the, the tangible showing. Something that's visible, touch, that you can touch. That shows that you have selected a different God than the God who identifies himself. Now, I want you to take note. In verse 17, you have the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet, and so on. Now, let me continue reading after verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself. We will listen, but do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance with Moses, while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, take note. God has explained all the Ten Commandments. He has given the Ten Commandments. Now, of those Ten Commandments, after having given them to Moses, Moses has gone back to the people. Now Moses is back with God. What is the first thing that God says to Moses? In verse 22, Then the Lord says to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Do you notice that? He could have picked any commandment. Sometimes we say that one commandment is greater than another. Some of us say that, oh, uh, uh, this is the worst. Or this is the worst. I know James tells us they're all the same. If you've broken one, you've broken the other. But the only one who can decide which is more important than the others is God. Okay? So which is the commandment that God re-emphasizes? That you don't make any images. And yet, that is where the people fall. You know... The Roman Catholic Church, when they had a um, great debate in the church, it's called the iconoclast um, division, they had already come to a point where there were many, many images and idols in the church. They had to decide what to do, because some people said, wait a minute, the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt have no images. Don't make idols. But the church had had so many pagan things come into the church, the church was all full of idols. And when the people rose up and said, This is not right, 
the church took the second commandment out of the Ten Commandments. So if you look at the list of the Ten Commandments in the Roman Catholic Church, you don't have the Ten Commandments. The second one is gone. The tenth one is divided into two. They think thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and make that number nine and take the others and thou shalt not covet is number ten. There has been an attack on that particular commandment because it was an issue from the beginning. So it was not a small matter with God. God had said, don't do this. He had repeated this. And yet when Moses came down from God having the Ten Commandments, what did he find them doing? Before an idol. God was displeased. Now, God was going to reject the people. And what did Moses say? Let's go to verse chapter 30 in the book of Exodus. Uh, 32, sorry. I'm going to skip a few verses and go to verse 30 in chapter 32. What has happened here, Moses has already been up to God the second time. And Moses has got from God some forgiveness on behalf of these people. Verse 30, the next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an, what? An atonement for sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive them their sin. But if not, then blot me out of your book that you have written. This is the book of life. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Moses goes back in verse chapter 34. This is the first approach that Moses makes to God. And what did God say? Go back. I will hold them guilty. Chapter 34. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and I will write on them. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets. This is now Moses goes back up to God and spends another 40 days with God. It's the second 40 days. Now, he comes back. Verse 27 of chapter 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant, lo, covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and, when they, were, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. They saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Moses was able to go back and renegotiate with God to give them an opportunity again to start a life again. And now in chapter 34, he comes back with the tablets of stone on which the Ten Commandments are written, and they were placed in the Ark of the Covenant. The second 40 days, when Moses went back up to God, 
The people were afraid. People were afraid. Because they knew that the judgment was taking place. And when Moses came back, they were waiting for the sentence. So what God had said. And Moses came back with the commandments. Say, here, we have a new start. We have a new relationship. Moses went up there to atone for the people, and he came back and told the people that they were, in fact, atoned back to God. On the tenth day of the seventh month, which we call the Day of Atonement, where the atonement was complete. Rosh Hashanah, which is the first day of the seventh month, ten days prior to Yom Kippur, is where the trumpets are sounded a hundred times on that day to bring people to attention and make them aware of their sins that they may come to confession. And then, on the evening of the ninth day, which is the beginning of the tenth day, they start the observance of Yom Kippur. We're going to take a few minutes covering the festival of Yom Kippur that we may understand what it really stands for. We know already what happens on that day. We've gone through the details of what happens and we have come to the conclusion that every festival that is given to us has minute details. Nothing that is left out. It's what you wear, how you stand, how you dress, uh, what you prepare, how you prepare it. We have every detail for every single feast. And we know the details of the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement starts with this on the evening of the ninth day which is the beginning of the 10th day. Psalm 130. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we with reverence serve you. Remember, people have confessed their sins. Judgment has taken place. They're waiting for the sentence. In court, when you go there the judge, and the trial is over, before the judge pronounces sentence, the judge says to the guilty party or whoever has been brought before the court, do you have anything to say? These people are saying, yes, I do. Before you pronounce sentence, this is what we got to say. If you, Lord, kept record of sins, Lord, who could stand before thee? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, be, we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And his word I put my hope. In other words, they're completely depending on the mercy of God. There is nothing good in me. I can bring nothing to you, O Father. I wait for the Lord more than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel. It doesn't say P.G. Isaac, does it? It says Israel. Why does it say Israel? Because the Day of Atonement was for the entire nation. It was not for individual judging. It was not for individual judging. It was for the judging of the nation. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. How much redemption? It doesn't say partial redemption, that okay, you're okay now, but I'm going to see how, it doesn't say that. With you is full redemption. Not there may be, there is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel 
from all their sins. Redeem who? All Israel. This is in the sanctuary setting. This is in the Jewish setting, which is the type. And we have in heaven the anti-type, where here the high priest goes on behalf of Israel before God. There Jesus goes on behalf of who? The whole world. So he himself redeemed Israel in the type, but in the anti-type, he himself re re will redeem the world from all their sins. This is the time at this reading is done during a time of what they call is the beginning of their affliction. The Bible tells us that on the day, day of atonement they, they ought to afflict themselves. There were five things that they were supposed to afflict themselves with. Afflict means to, 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 to punish themselves, to, to do away with. One, food. No eating. Number two, no leather shoes. Number three, no bathing, luckily only for one day. Number three, no anointing. You know, they should put oil on their head for anointing, right? No anointing, no sexual activity. All these items are related to our body. There are those who teach that this was an affliction, which is a negative affliction, but instead what it was to the Jews and is to this day is showing that they have by the power of God to do away with the fleshly things and focus on the spiritual. To do away with the needs of this world to focus on the spiritual and the eternal. This affliction also prepared the people to accept the forgiveness of God. During this time, they also had another celebration. But before I go into that, I want to ask you guys, this is a pop quiz. When a covenant is made, we know there were blood covenants made between humans and countries and peoples and tribes. There's a blood covenant made between God and man. How easy was it to change a covenant? Could you change a covenant? How many think you can change a covenant? You've got to get an F. I'm telling you now. How many? Okay, luckily none of you raise your hand. How easy was it to cancel a covenant? I'm just telling you, giving you a hint. It's not possible. So how many of you think that's possible to cancel a covenant? It is not possible. The only way it's possible is through blood and death. In the practice of Yom Kippur, the Jewish nation had developed a system that represents the forgiveness of God. Where they could make a covenant with God that would be over and above the covenants that God had given him. You know, many of us feel that we are more righteous than others, right? So if everybody else uh, studies their Bible for a half hour, we study for three, and then we feel that we're more, well, we are, we are more righteous, right? Or... If one person is helping somebody with uh, their problems and gives them $100 and we feel, oh, well, I'll give $1,000, we feel more special. Sometimes we make covenants with God, with one another. Uh, uh, anybody heard of New Year resolutions? What are New Year resolutions? That I'm going to give up this, I'm going to give up this, I'm going to, right? Is there anybody here who's always kept every New Year resolution? There were opportunities for Jews to make resolutions with God over and above the 613 commandments that God had given to them. Those commandments, if they felt, became too difficult. They were stuck. They had to go before a council of three judges called Kol Nadere. And there they would explain why they can no longer keep their covenant. 
they would listen to them, the judges would listen to them, and then they would come back with a decision. The decision could be a couple of different ways. It was called the Hatarat Nadirim. It gave people an opportunity to get out of their vows, get out of their covenant. There were two ways. One, okay, your covenant will stay on the record that you promised that you are going to give the church $1,000 every month. I know you all have done that. But now you find that your job is not as good, so you can't keep it. It'll stay on record, but you don't have to do it anymore. The second way was to annul completely. Completely. As if they never made the covenant. As if it was never there. Never happened. They never broke a covenant. They never made a covenant. That is the second part of the celebration that the people of Israel had during their beginning of the Day of Atonement. So they could come to God and pray that he would forgive them to the extent that there would be no memory of their sin. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. We'll go to verse 18. Maybe we'll go a little bit before that. Verse 18. Let's go to verse 16. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist the rebel, resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. This requirement of God for the living and the and expectations of the people of Israel was with regard to what? To live as my people in order that you may obtain Canaan. Your sins will be forgotten. You will be good as new. They started their relationship all over again. And through the sacrifices of daily sacrifices of sin, and through the annual day of atonement, they started a new relationship with God. Now what happened after the day of atonement? How did it end? By the way, how many hours was the day of atonement? Anybody remember? Does the number 25 ring a bell? 25 hours, not 24 hours. How long is a day? Usually. Yeah. 24 hours. This was 25 hours. Why? Why? When the day was done, the 25th hour was the continuation of their relationship with God. The redemption had taken place. On the Day of Atonement, redemption was complete. It was not the beginning of the judgment. It was the verdict of the judgment. And they continued after that with their life with God. And the next feast was going to be what? Feast of Tabernacles, which we're going to study next week. Now, here's what they did. They fasted all day. Did they go and eat right away, the Jews? If I fasted all day, I'd probably faint because I'm diabetic. But they fasted all day. 
And at the end of the 24th hour, they didn't eat. They danced for joy. So the Day of Atonement started the celebration because they'd gained victory and they'd been atoned. That's why it's called the Day of Atonement, not the Day of Judgment. That is the completion of forgiveness where their sins were like scarlet and they're now like snow. They danced and they sang songs of joy and they cried tears of joy. Some people say, oh, yeah, there was weeping. The weeping wasn't for their bad things. The weeping was for the joy. They couldn't believe the greatness, the goodness of God. I remember... I didn't like watching Indian movies when I was a kid, and I don't like watching Indian movies now. I don't like all the dancing that just comes up and people <laughs> singing stupid songs. But why I didn't like it when I was younger was because I didn't like crying. And Indian movies always made me cry. It was like uh, uh, some brothers or sisters or parents and children got separated from one another, and then they grow up, and come back together, and it is so sad. You sit there in front of everybody. <laughs> you try not to cry, but you're crying because they're happy they're back together again. Isn't that right? You ever cry at an airport when you haven't seen anybody for a long time and there's no possibility of seeing them again? You get so excited. And this is the tears of joy for the forgiveness of God. The other part, that the children of Israel, the people of Israel, celebrated then and, the, and, and they celebrate today as part of their Yom Kippur. As they speak of, get this, they speak of different kinds of sins, but the sin that they focus on more than others is our words. Our words. Why? As they recognize and the Bible recognizes that there are more sins committed by our language, by what we say, than what we do. In a day, you don't know how many people we've been rude to, mean to, don't know how many people we have gossiped about, don't know how many times we've said things we shouldn't have said, how many times we have degraded the character of God. They used to focus on that. The other point that's important to remember. All of the prayers of Israel said by every priest and every person, they were never ever said in the singular. It was always in the plural. That we come to you, dear God. Israel comes to you. This was not a time for a sentence of each individual's testing and judgment. It was the judgment of the nation. Again, this is kind of interesting, but somehow they talked about vomiting. Can you believe that? I've got to tell you a story about that. It was about vomiting. Something doesn't settle well. And what was that about? I'll tell you that in a minute, but I can tell you another story. Last week, uh, I had some little nieces and nephews visiting. I ended up going to Canada's Wonderland with kids, four kids, me and three others, and uh, made a deal with them. I'm not going to go on any rides that go circular like this. I said, I'm going to get sick. No, 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 no. They'd already made a list of 21 rides. I said, have you ever been on 21 rides before? No. How many have you been to? The Lord, the lines are too long. We've been to 12. That's it. That's it. Oh, 21 today. And on this uh, one ride that looked a little suspicious, we went just after we had had pizza. And uh, Bia, the young girl, she said, Uncle, I dare you to go on that one I, and I'm not one to back away from a dare, especially from an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> so uncle went on the ride. 
And I came back. And they said, oh, let's run to that one. Let's, let's, let's. I said, can we walk instead? And as we walked a little closer to the second ride, or the next ride, I said, look, I tell you what, you guys go on ahead. I'll just sit here for a while. And they said, okay. They went there and said, are you coming? Are you coming? No, I'm just going to lay this. There's some concrete. I'll lay down on the concrete. Closed my eyes. Didn't want to. There's lights shining on my face. By then it was nighttime. Then they came back. Ready to go? I said, I'll tell you what. You just stand over there. Get a little farther away. I knelt down across the... Uh, the, 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 the concrete, and there was a garden on the other side, and I just made the, give the garden a little bit more manure. <laughs> People must have thought I was going to pray there. And everything that was not feeling comfortable in here came out. And guess how many rides I went on after that? But Vomiting. If we eat something or have something in our stomachs that doesn't belong, it comes out. And so the Jews remember at this time the story of Jonah. And they remember also at this time, they, they, they remember a, a prayer <coughs> which states that God has told them that there are certain sins that the land of Israel will not tolerate. And if the, if the children of Israel commit those sins, the land of Israel will vomit them out of the land. So they remember those and they recite those at this time. Why? Because they then use that to apply them to the nation of Israel. And as a nation, they vomit out all that is not like them. Anything that is unlike the representatives of God. And they start their atonement and their atoned life together. The men of the families, they wear what they call a kittle, which is a... Um, Wrapping cloth of the dead. That's what they, they, they bury their dead in. The women sometimes wear white on the Day of Atonement. And when they wear that kettle on that date, it reminds them that the sinner is dead. And the sinless is before God on the Day of Atonement. They have been redeemed. It is for that reason that any explanation of the Day of Atonement, this is the fourth sermon on the Day of Atonement. We've gone through every detail. There is no way that anybody can extract the teaching that on the Day of Atonement any judgment started didn't happen. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's a heretical teaching that came from a source that is completely not biblical. The Day of Atonement is a time when God accepts the atonement of our high priest, Jesus Christ, who we are told, go to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Well, go to verse 32. God has raised Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Does that say God is going to raise Jesus Christ? What does it say? God has, in the past, raised Jesus Christ. And exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promise of the promised Holy Spirit. And it has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Jesus is all ready. At that time when Peter was preaching the sermon, Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit would not have come. And because he was at the right hand of the Father in the most holy place and his, and his sacrifice and his atonement accepted by God, that he was able to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came to the people in a mighty way. The only thing that's waiting now is now, verse 35. How long is he going to sit at the right hand of the Father? Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. When will that happen? When Jesus comes, the second coming. And that is the Feast of Tabernacles, when we reside with God. Go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews. Chapter 1. Verse 13. To which the angels... Did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? To no angels. Who did he say it to? Jesus Christ. Go to verse 9. But we, but we do not see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Now crowned with glory. Not that he is going to be crowned at a later date. At the writing of the book of Hebrews, Paul tells us that he was already now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Verse 11, both the one who makes people holy, those who are made holy are of the same family so that Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. We were declared brothers and sisters before God when he went up. Go to chapter 4, verse 14 of the book of Hebrews. Again, the apostle Paul is referring to Jesus Christ at the high priest, high priest, the day of atonement. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us, up, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Does it say that we've got to wait and see if we can approach the throne of God? Where is the throne of God, may I ask you? In the holy place or the most holy place? In the most holy place. And where is Jesus at the throne of God? In the holy place or the most holy place? In the most holy place. Why? Because he has interceded for us with his blood at the mercy seat so that we may go boldly, not afraid that my time of judgment may come. Why? Because we have been covered. That is what makes the gospel the gospel. The word gospel is good news. If it's going to scare me about my salvation, where's the good news in that? The good news is that Jesus lived that I cannot live. Jesus died because I could not die. Jesus resurrected so that I may be resurrected. Jesus represents me in heaven as if I am there now, in that if I was to die today, or if Jesus comes right now, I would be with God. That is a promise of the gospel. Chapter 6, verse 17. I'm going to cut down the number of verses for the sake of time. Verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forefather Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't say that he's going to go there 1,800 years from now. He has entered there now. Chapter 7, verse 22. Because of this oath, Jesus has become 
the guarantor of a better covenant. Not that Jesus will become a guarantor for this covenant for us. He is. He's there now. Anybody ever had to get a co-signer or know of anybody that had to get a co-signer for a loan? You go and try and get a loan and the bank says, get out of here. Right? You don't have a proper job, you have bad credit history, and then you go to your mom or dad or maybe an in-law or two, and you go and say, I need... And then you go ahead and get a co-signer who's the guarantor, so the payment doesn't get made. Who makes the payment? The guarantor. Right? The guarantor makes the payment. And then... We get whatever it is that we are wanting the guarantee for, and we go around as, as if I did the whole thing myself. You know, Jesus Christ is the guarantor of our eternal life. Now, read verse 1 of chapter 8. Now, the main point of what we're saying is this we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. I ask you again, where is the throne of the majesty of heaven? Holy place? Most holy place. He sat down at the right hand and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. Verse 6, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received, it's not says that Jesus is going to receive, the ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs, he's talking about the earthly priests, as the covenant of which he is mediator in, is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Verse, chapter, chapter 9, verse 6. Look at verse 5. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement coverage, the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry out, carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is showing by, by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. What this is saying is, until the coming of Jesus Christ, the priests and the sacrifices were symbolic pointing to what was going to come. Verse 11, But when Jesus came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made of human hands. So which tabernacle is that? In heaven. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Don't let anybody tell you about any kind of judgment that's taking place starting in the year 1844. No such thing. Jesus was there at the time that this was written. Nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 20. This is the blood of the covenant, 
which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremony. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Keep reading. Verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that, only, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. Now to appear, now to appear for us in God's presence. He didn't go there for himself. He went there for us. And I just want to point out one other thing. The high priest on the Day of Atonement, made. he went into the most holy place twice. Once for himself. He had a sacrifice of a bull for himself. He went there to make sure that he was worthy. And when his sacrifice was accepted, he came back now and went back a second time on behalf of the entire nation. When Jesus was resurrected, and he said to Mary, do not touch me. Right? He said, don't touch me. He had not yet been to the Father to be acknowledged as the high priest. He went there, and we know that he came back. So that was the first time he entered into the most holy place. Because he said, I have not yet been to the Father. But then he had been to the Father. Where's the Father? In the most holy place. Now we can have waiting outside the tent. He's in the most holy place. He comes back. Now he goes back after 40 days. 40 days. Remember the 40 days? He goes back in the day of atonement. Let me read verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages, to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He entered once for all. To do away with sin for all. Just as people are destined to die once. And after that, to, uh, after that, to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of the many. And he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That is the Feast of Tabernacles. Chapter 10, verse 12. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Not that complicated. When God wants to communicate with anybody, he doesn't make it complicated. He doesn't make hoops for us to try and find explanations here and there and everywhere. And then, you know, you can touch your nose like this or you could go like, do it like that. You don't need to do that. When God wants to communicate, he does it very well and very clearly. It's right here. It's in the word of God. That is the good news of the gospel. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is before God. And the good news is that for us, for us, redemption is now. And it is the power of God, like in John chapter 22, when the spirit of God comes in us we begin to become, become transformed. And the transformation is not that I can keep commandment number one, two, three, four, five. That's not it. The Bible tells us clearly, Old Testament and New Testament, that the proof of the transformation, the fruit of the Spirit, is in our attitude toward those that are difficult to like. A proof of our conversion is in this. That when I spend a dollar on myself, I have to think, 
is there somebody else that needs that dollar more than I do? It's hard to do. That is why. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. That is why he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because for us to try to do those things is not possible. We cannot be the Good Samaritan. We cannot do what the church in the book of Acts did. What did they say? They sold everything and gave it to those who needed. That is the judgment. That is how we judge. And every time I judge myself based on that, I lose. The Bible says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is the requirement. So if I think that somehow I can do all these things and that I can become perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect, so I can go happily and stand before God, hey, yeah, I did all that. When the Bible says, here are those that keep the commandments of God, it doesn't say that here are those that keep the Sabbath, although I believe the Sabbath is absolutely necessary to be kept. That's not what it says. Here are those that keep the commandments. Why? Because Jesus kept them. They're covered by Jesus Christ. Here are those that are as perfect as God himself. That God, when the angels saw him, the cherubim saw him, they covered their eyes and they covered their feet. That is the God to whom we must go. And we cannot go there with any goodness that's in us. Therefore, when the standard is set, in the Old Testament it says, if you kill somebody, and Jesus said, I've said to you, even if you hate somebody, Jesus isn't expecting you to all of a sudden not love everybody because, you know, nobody's going to do it. The point that he's making is this. It is so hard not to be angry at your siblings. I know that. It is so hard not to be angry at your siblings or your workers or your companions. It is so hard that we have to give up and say, dear God, I can't do this. I can't do this. Cover me with Jesus Christ. And when Jesus breathes into us the breath of life and the Spirit of God, He begins to transform us little by little, day by day. And may God grant that when He does transform us, that we don't notice it. Because when we begin to think we are righteous, we're in trouble. May God grant that each of us continue to study the word of God in our homes. Question every word that you hear from this pulpit and any other pulpit and compare it to the word of God. If it's not here, it's not for us. I continue to pray for you and I beseech your prayers for me. God bless you.